Hey, once again, one of our favorites, Jesse Simonton, of course, on three national college football columnist, and he's also featured on the Andy Staples show. Jesse, outstanding, the best beard that's ever been on this show, my man. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well, doing well. Man. I'll, we'll see how much longer I got it. I had it, I had it ready for a ski trip. That way, I wouldn't get cold. So it served me well. Yeah, well, it looks fantastic on you. But let me ask you. So, I uh, really wanted to, to get it on a deep dive on Kalen DeBoer. But before we get into that, Nick Saban, of course, uh, retiring at Alabama. I know I've been kind of leading the uh, the Kang Dynasty narrative and all that. But uh, really, this this caught me off guard, Jesse. I I thought at least another year he'd be there at Alabama. How, how surprised were you that he made the decision uh, that, that just kind of has shocked the, the college football world here? I was stunned, man. I, I got to tell you, I was in Nashville uh, wrapping up at the AFCA Coaches Convention. I had just gotten done about, I want to say, 90 minutes before the news broke, leaving uh the room where i was with david oven and some other national guys and you know they we had just left the room where Dabo sweeney and ryan day and uh you know sunny dykes and a bunch of acc coaches um had all left and you know they had kind of done their you know arguing and back and forth between you know how to fix the ills of the sport with the transfer portal and signing day and the calendar and whatnot um but we just missed this short window, Mike, where to be there and to get their live reaction. Can you imagine getting Dabo Sweeney's live reaction walking out of that meeting, hearing the news that Nick Saban retired? So I do think in the last week or so, there's been some revisionist history with folks being like, oh, well, you could tell this sign and that sign. And maybe you could piece some of that stuff together. But I think the what, what you've seen and, and kind of the rash of, of kind of portal entries and, and whatnot, you know, kind of the exiting that's happening in Alabama. I think everybody was surprised. And so now we're kind of dealing, we as the collective media and, and the, the Alabama themselves are kind of dealing uh, with the repercussions of something that frankly, Mike, I think if, if you gave Tide fans truth serum, they probably regret making the playoff now because if this happens earlier, they get to kick the clock, you know, on, on Saban's retirement. You get a coach in there, and suddenly Alabama's not only losing players to the portal, but you could be adding players because it probably would have been within that transfer portal window. Instead, you lose to Michigan in overtime. Saban retires, and now the way we see it, that you know, Alabama really got screwed by the NCAA rules where their roster can be plucked, but they can't go and do anything until the spring window. So – it's all been kind of fascinating and stunning at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's so many ways to go with this, Jesse, but uh, you put out something that, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to ask you about. Oh, but before you ask, before I get into that, I, I did want to ask you, with Nick Saban no longer at Alabama, does this does Georgia just become the next Alabama and we all bow down to Kirby and, and what he's built? And, and when I say that, Jesse, uh, it, it was funny. I was doing a show, a show with T-Bob Bear the, the day prior and we were looking at the last 10 national champions, and they were all either Alabama or a team that beat Alabama. The, the lone exception was, in fact, Georgia, what was it, uh, 2022? TCU. Right. But every other one, you basically, you're Alabama or you had to beat Alabama. Do, do you think that's what Georgia turns into the next however long Kirby's there? Or does this open it up for – Many teams in the SEC and around college football, and and I'm you know I'm thinking I'm not saying Texas is going to dominate, LSU is going to dominate. Let's say Nico's awesome. I'm not saying Tennessee is going to dominate, but maybe like every three or four years, those programs can win a national championship. How how do you see the landscape without Nick Saban? Well, I, that's a great question, Mike. I <clears throat> I don't know if some of those programs that you name can necessarily win a national championship every three or four years, but I do think you're going to see in this 12-team playoff, and we're seeing it in real time, uh, where a team like Ole Miss, hey, this is our year to push our chips into the table. So I don't think Ole Miss, frankly, can win a national championship in 2024, but I think they can now make the college football playoff. And so I do think you're going to see that. 
in a Nick Saban powerless or Nick Saban less SEC, I do think there's a power vacuum that needs to be filled. And I actually have a column that's coming out on, at on three that I think LSU has an opportunity here to maybe slide into that role in leapfrog Alabama. However, no program benefits more from Nick Saban retiring than Georgia because Georgia was already positioned as a superpower. They've already done it twice. They just recruited the number one recruiting class in the country. And now they don't have to go up against Nick Saban on the recruiting trail. So Kirby Smart and even Hugh Freeze and, and Steve Sarkeesian, they're three steps ahead of Kalen DeBoer right now. And you could argue that Kirby's four or five steps ahead because of the infrastructure, foundation, the fact that he was able to, you know, grab T- – he made that move to get Tavares Robinson. And then Georgia was able to withstand Alabama and Kalen DeBoer circling back and being like, oops, my bad. We, should, we, we, we probably should have named you the defensive coordinator because now we're going to lose our entire secondary, our best player in Caleb Downs, and our top probably assistant recruiter. Travaris Robinson says, man, it's actually better for my career to go hitch my wagon to Kirby Smart, learn under him like I have Josh Champ and Nick Saban, and maybe when Glenn Schumann becomes a head coach in a year or two, I can fill that defensive coordinator role at Georgia and, and kind of see my rocket ship path. Um, so, yeah, I think Georgia benefits greatly from this situation. And then there is the opportunity for the Tennessees and the LSUs um, you know, to maybe fill that power vacuum with the old misses and Missouri's maybe doing the, hey, every three or four years we push our chips in and, and we're trying to make a run for the playoff. Mm-hmm. The thing that I was alluding to, so we all know Kalen DeBoer, he's at Alabama now. And just looking at his his resume, I mean, it's pretty damn impressive what he did at Washington, what he did at Sioux Falls. Of course, you know, that's a lot of people are holding that against him because it was such a lower level. But I think you could just as easily spin it and say, well, teams like Oregon, teams like Texas, teams like Southern Cal, he was beating at Washington. He didn't have near as much talent as them. And now... Yes, the roster is getting picked apart right now, but this is going to be far and away the best roster he's ever had to work with. Now, it's not going to be as good. But it's going to be a top 10 roster, I think, barring significant more players leaving. He's still going to have a, you know, a good hand here. But you put it out there that uh, you know this is a major – I'm going to just quote you here – the major dice roll because you're not going to out-scheme Kirby Smart – Steve Sarkeesian, et cetera. This is a talent acquisition game. The best rosters are going to win. And you even said good won't cut it. Josh Heupel, we've seen strong recruiter when he when he's at Tennessee. They've improved there, but it's still not good enough. Can, can you go a little bit deeper on, um, which I agree with you 100%. I mean, it, it, talent matters more than coaching in my mind. But uh, and, and I think even in the first 24 hours, we have seen kind of – like a welcome to the SEC moment with that T. Rob situation you alluded to there. So, uh, the thoughts on on DeBoer at Alabama, given that uh, that tweet you put out. Yeah, I also had a follow up column that I wrote that I encourage a lot of folks have checked it out, but I encourage you know your followers and listeners to check it out. That Kalen DeBoer is an unconventional hire. There's no doubt about that, but that doesn't mean it's not going to work. You don't, as you even said. Uh, while some are holding his Sioux Fall record against him, you know, you don't luck into winning a hundred some odd games and basically being able to count your losses on two hands. You know, I mean, uh, like there's only so many countries in, or coaches in America that can do that. There is, however, I think real question and concern about Kalen DeBoer's ability to recruit mano e mano against the best in the SEC. And make no mistake, that is the expectations and should be at Alabama. Nick Saban's gone, but the infrastructure and everything around that program are still available and there for a coach to take advantage of. I do think, like as you said, I think Alabama's still going to have a top 10 roster next year. I have no doubt that Alabama's going to make hell and, and raise, you know, make all sorts of hay in the spring transfer portal window. The question is, can Kalen DeBoer do what he has never done in his coach, whether it was at Sioux Falls or specifically 
Indiana or Washington, which is recruit top flight, recruit top flight, top light talent. He's never signed a five star prospect. They even signed like eight of them a year ago. You know, I mean, it, it, it is, I think, a notable concern. And while Alabama's can, can poo poo, Alabama fans can poo poo it and, and make excuses for it. Kalen DeBoer just got a team in Washington to the national championship game, which is extremely impressive. He did that largely on the heels with Jimmy Lake's players and transfers that he brought in. Michael Penix obviously being the headliner of that list. But the three receivers were all guys that Jimmy Lake uh, or Chris Peterson had brought into the program. Most of those offensive linemen saying Kalen DeBoer was able to do something with that group. But he hasn't exactly replenished the roster the last two years that was going to say, hey, in 2024, 2025, we're ready to reload. Washington, getting to the national championship game, still was only able to sign a top 30 class. You can recruit better than that at Washington. And yet, Kalen DeBoer and his staff were not doing that. They were emphasizing, and I do think it is a compliment, they were emphasizing their staff's ability to develop talent. We are, we've seen that. You can't outdevelop Kirby Smart. Because not only is he signing these five stars, he is also developing the Lad McConkeys and the Jordan Davises and these guys who are also turning into pros. Uh, I don't think this is a Brian Harson situation. You know, people have kind of connected that. Oh, a guy from the Northwest comes to the SEC with no ties to the South, can't do it. Kalen DeBoer is a much better coach than that. But that doesn't mean there aren't, I think, real red flags about his ability uh, to supplement and reload the roster more than just what he's inherited. Yeah, and I heard someone say this the other day, Jesse, and I and I kind of it kind of put me in, stopped me in my tracks, so to speak. He, he they made the point that the offense that he that DeBoer inherits at Alabama is. is basically across the board, not as good as the, as the Washington one. And I was like, that can't be right. But I started thinking about it. Michael Penix or Jalen Milrow? I mean, I think rational people would say Penix is better. Uh, the offensive line at Washington just won the Joe Moore Award. The offensive line at Alabama, while, t- while talented, held them back a lot of the time. Uh, I think the same thing with the receivers. Washington had really good receivers. Alabama had talent, but kind of inconsistent, not a game breaker there. And now, you know, transfer and, and, and NFL departures. I think the only one you could argue is maybe running backs, even though Dylan Johnson was really good. Does that speak to DeBoer's ability to, to get the most out of these guys? Because certainly no one would have traded all those Washington pieces two years ago with Alabama's current situation. But uh, does that – would that concern you at all or, or – does that speak to DeBoer's ability to develop? I, I think a little bit of both. I, I, it absolutely speaks to DeBoer, DeBoer's ability to develop. Um, it does concern you, though, because, uh, you know, what is he going to do with the pieces that are left over? I mean, I think Jam Miller and, and Haynes, uh, Justice Haynes, are going to be just fine at running back. I think that, that they're going to be set there. Um, I think they're probably going to get better play from the offensive line, although – you're, you're concerned that you're now having to replace both tackles because Latham's going to go off to the NFL and you just lost Caden Proctor to the transfer portal. Less than ideal there. I, I'm going to be curious with what he can do uh, with Jalen Milrow. You know, it, 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 I don't know if it was in, uh, intentional or unintentional, but the fact that Isaiah Bond, you know, kind of, uh, I think, kind of threw his quarterback under the bus when he committed to Texas with some of those comments. Um, you know, it, this is a fascinating, it's a fascinating deal. We've never seen, you know, Alabama kind of wheeze like this. Um, and they are, you know, their roster is being picked apart. It's kind of a feeding frenzy. I, I think Caleb losing Caleb Downs, um, is just a huge, huge blow. I mean, he is, he is a transcendent talent and, and a true phenom in every sense of the word. And now, so Caleb DeBoer is having to replace his entire secondary. Um, and frankly, you know, Frame it like this, Mike. Years ago, if you had told yourself, uh, five years ago, excuse me, if you had told yourself that Alabama was going to have the offensive and defensive coordinators at Indiana effectively leading their program, people would have said you, you, you've been in the nut house. 
Right. You know, I mean, no one would. And then if you told them that they were at, not only were they leading Alabama, but they were effectively the top choices uh, to replace Nick Saban and, and, you know, his outgoing staff there. It's, I think long-term the tide are going to be fine. There's just too much infrastructure there, but they could be in some, you know, be in store for some short-term pain here. Um and that, and that's tough. You know, it's not DeBoer's fault that they have this 30 day window that, you know, he's now having to really combat. Um, and it's not his fault that, you know, that almost every player on Alabama's roster couldn't pick out Caleb DeBoer from a lineup five days ago. Yeah. And that's what he's up against. And I've heard this point too, Jesse, that, uh, again, I'm, I'm sure Alabama's got a lot of money in NIL. I'm not silly enough to say they don't, but, I don't think it touches Texas or or A and M and maybe even Tennessee and, and and some others. I'm but again, I'm sure it's high. But I've seen the point. Well, they don't have Nick Saban anymore to to say, you know, take a little bit less, what have you. I, I don't know what these conversations are, but you know, you trust in the man because he's gotten everybody to the NFL. He 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 gets the most out of them, and they make a ton of money. Do you think? How bad will that hurt Alabama, you think, in these recruiting? Where, as good as Kalen DeBoer is, and he may be able to, to sell some of that as well, He's, it's not going to be near the level that Saban was able to – kind of the Nick Saban discount, so to speak, in the NIL world. Will that, how bad will that hurt Alabama? Oh, I think, I think this is one of the, the biggest storylines behind the scenes, Mike, because it's not it, – it is, it is now being magnified because Saban's gone. Again, put, in per, to put into perspective the type of recruiting that's happened at Alabama since Saban was there. He signed 10 number one ranked recruiting classes. 10. He has just stacked five stars on five stars. And so what that does is he has developed and sent so many of these guys to the NFL that there is a proof of concept waiting there. And the same thing has happened at Georgia and Ohio. Even though Ohio State hasn't had the success on the field requisite to what Buckeyes fans expect to beat Michigan, can win the Big Ten. They're, they're bit, Ryan Day's benefited from that same uh, sort of, you don't have to pay the upfront NIL, Georgia, absolutely. And it's the proof of concept that, hey, if you come here, we have the coaches and the infrastructure to get you to where you want to go. Where's the big money? The NFL, making that second paycheck, being a three-and-done guy or four-year guy, going off to the league and kickstarting that clock so you can make real money. And so Alabama has benefited from that. Georgia's benefited from that. Ohio State, et cetera. Very few other programs. Take Saban out. These guys, again, they don't know who Kalen DeBoer is. They've now heard that, yeah, he's a heck of a coach and he's won a ton of games. How many guys has he sent to the NFL? I, I'm a cornerback. Can he get me to the league? Nick Saban. You know, j- just has sent, you know, you can name all the Marlon Humphrey, Fitzpatrick, all these guys that were first round picks. Is he, is Kalen DeBoer going to be able to do that for me? Oh, he might be able to, but no, the price just went up because I know a guy in Athens that can. I know a guy out at Oregon that probably can. Now, Oregon is, is an outlier here because they do, I pay, you know, uh, in terms of high school and transfer portal, top dollar for, uh, I would say reportedly, you know, uh, pay top dollar, you know, NIL money for some of these guys. So this is going to be a huge deal. Now, I think Alabama, again, they're going to be able to raise the money, but it's, you know, can they get the guys uh, to, to kind of take it, to, to, to frankly, to bet that Kalen DeBoer is the guy that can still get them and, and fulfill their dreams? Because we know, it. yeah, these guys want to win. They, they want to chase rings, they chase titles, uh, but the league is is kind of the ultimate goal for a lot of these players, um, and that's frankly where they're going to kind of flock towards, you know, who can best position them to kind of fulfill those dreams. So safe to say, based on everything you just said, that uh, the bigger challenge for, for DeBoer, I mean, I realize he's the roster's bleeding a little bit right now. They'll, they'll add via the transfer portal, I'm sure, and they just signed another top class, We'll see how well that they, they get all those guys because those guys can leave now too, I believe. But um, is the bigger challenge to, to keep Alabama in the playoff race next season, which I think they'll firmly be, be there, or is it two, three years down the road maintaining that? Because 
you know, they always say it's easier to, to reach the mountaintop than it is to stay there. And, and DeBoer, he, he didn't have to do the heavy lifting, but they're there already. I, I would certainly say the bigger challenge to him is, is to maintain it. What, what would you say to that? I, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, we, we, we saw what he did uh, with Jimmy Lake's, you know, roster. Again, that was a 4-8 and eight team, and they won 11 games the next year. Now, it wasn't hemorrhaged, uh, you know, like this one is. But it also didn't start from such a position of strength like Alabama's. And and I think we're in agreement as well. They're going to replace some of these. They're, you're not going to replace a Caleb Downs. There's, that, there's no sugar coat in that. You're not replacing a guy like him. But you, you can go in to the transfer portal in the spring and grab you a couple really good ready-made receivers. The Caleb aboard that we know that he can figure out ways to utilize and scheme up. You can go in and, and grab – uh, you know, some, some guys in the secondary and say, hey, it hasn't worked out for LSU, you know, doing the whole transfer portal U to, to DVU thing. But frankly, maybe we believe we can we kind of get these guys in position and better. Uh, the question is going to be sustainability. You just, yes, you inherited the number one recruiting class. What does the 2025 class look like for Alabama, which you've already seen a rash of decommitments, including a couple five stars? What does the 26 and 27 class look like when Texas and Auburn and Georgia have just stacked on another three top five recruiting classes? Oh, yeah, LSU right now has the number one ranked recruiting class in 2025 with the top ranked quarterback, the top ranked wide receiver, and the top ranked running back, according to on three. That's what Kalen is up against. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm seeing a lot of frustration, and, and you kind of uh, commented on it as well, just how, how Alabama's kind of left out to dry here because they made the playoff. Now they can't really pick apart rosters like people are doing to them. And I, I was listening to a Texas show the other day, Jesse, and they were like, well, you know, there's no one we want on, on Arizona's roster or, or Washington roster, but – we know Harbaugh is going to leave, so let's start looking at Michigan's roster and let's pray to God that Brian Kelly takes the Michigan job because then we can start picking apart LSU's roster and whoever takes the LSU job, you know, that's going to be a, probably a good coach. So we can start – I mean, this this seems like it has to change, but is there anybody that's actually going to do that? Will change be coming or is it, is it just people bitching about how this is a flawed system? What Do you think things will actually change? I don't, I don't know. I have a I have a huge story coming out. We can tease it here on Monday. I'm, I haven't finished it yet, but still working. But from speaking to a ton of people in Nashville at the AFCA Coaches Convention, just about um, a lot of gripes and problems with the transfer portal, we are barreling towards. Um, we are already up against you know a tsunami uh, of issues, and we are now barreling towards where. It's untenable unless we basically figure out a way to, to kind of make these uh, players employees, whether it's with, uh, you know, um, shared revenue, contracts within the conference. There's a lot of different frameworks you can put together. But for the first time, I kind of felt a consensus from the coaches that, yeah, that we're all for, we're, we're, we're for freedom of movement. We're for NIL. Um, but there needs to be some sort of parameters and guardrails uh, to make this thing at least somewhat level. Um, the NCAA didn't intend, you know, I think, you know, for this to kind of happen. They had, I do, I do think that they in good faith thought that, okay, we're going to have the first transfer portal window, but if there is, uh, you know, a coaching change, players aren't going to be tethered to that. So there's going to be some freedom. I think they have the foresight to say, Hey, the season now goes even later coaching carousel because of the NFL can really restart at any moment. Um, Saban's retirement wasn't the NFL, but it effectively was kind of like the NFL timing. Um, and so now Alabama and Washington and Arizona are kind of paying for those repercussions. You touched on Michigan. I will say, I think they could be an outlier here if Harbaugh does indeed go to the league and whether he takes the Chargers job or the Raiders job or what have you because they have a ready-made guy on staff, if they promote Sharon Moore, there will still be some teams that pluck um, from, from Michigan's roster because some players will, will I'm, I'm sure, leave. Um, but I think the frame where – I think the foundation of that roster is going to be pretty safe if they promote Sharon Moore. Now, if they do do what you kind of teased 
you know, go grab Brian Kelly. And he decided, hey, I, I can't, I don't want to fight it in the SEC. I'd rather go back to the North uh, or Midwest. Then all, then all hell's loose. <laughs> then, then, then we're going to see. Uh, because LSU certainly has tons of guys that, that Alabama would want or whoever, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that just, uh, yeah, that, that would, that you talk about a feeding frenzy that would create a, another, you know, spiraling domino effect uh, for, for a lot of schools across the country. Now you wrote recently at on three about Caleb Downs and how he's a, a rare exception, a non quarterback that could kind of swing the championship mm-hmm. race next season. Uh, I, I think that, I would buy into that, certainly at Georgia, given what they already have and, and teaming him up with Malachi Starks and, and all. And, I mean, my God, just think about the secondary they would have there. But you include that in Ohio State. What, what's your thoughts on, on Caleb Downs and, and why he's such a dynamic uh, player there? Yeah, I mean, I really do think that if he chooses either Georgia or Ohio State, which those seem to be the two programs that he's down to, he is that he's kind of that transcendent of a player. Um, you know, he was a, a plug and play guy as a, as a five-star freshman. You know, I joked in my column that if they gave out six stars, he would be one of the, the, the few elite uh, to kind of earn such a ranking. I mean, he's that good. He led Alabama in tackles, you know, first freshman to do that since the seventies. Um, he's, a, he's just a, a smart kid, super football IQ. Um, and so if you plug him in, as you said, if, if he's next to Malachi Starks, that's the best, safety duo in the country if he goes to ohio state you talk about all the pieces that the buckeyes are bringing back jt is coming back sawyer williams um you know uh you're bringing back the other safety so he could pair with him you, you may be able to move five-star sunny ship um down to nickel or will linebacker he would just give uh jim Knowles and that defense a lot of versatility i think ohio state i, I had a column on this right before i went skiing uh, basically kind of writing about, I, I think Ryan Day is kind of um, reworking Ohio State's identity for 2024. They, I think, kind of like Ole Miss are kind of pushing their chips into the table with all these guys coming back. You're getting Judkins out of the portal. You grab Will Howard. Is Will Howard that much better than Kyle McCord? I don't know, but I do think he fits the identity of what Ohio State's trying to be. You know, Ryan Day puffed his chest real big to Lou Holtz and say, hey, we're tough. <laughs> All the pieces have proved that they, he didn't think they were tough enough. So what has he done? He's gone out and kind of supplemented the roster with, you know, McLaughlin at Alabama couldn't snap, but he's, you know, he's a nasty blocker. Maybe move him move him to guard. You bring back, you know, Travion Henderson. You get a guy in Judkins who can break all sorts of tackles. Will Howard, maybe not the best thrower, but suddenly the QB run game, the power game that worked so well under Urban Meyer, back in play at Ohio State. Um, so I, I think if you add Caleb Downs to that mix, he could kind of be the cherry on top. Um, they could kind of, you know, again, I don't think this is – if he goes to Georgia, that doesn't mean they're definitely winning the national championship. Or if he goes to Ohio State, same thing. I just think wh- whichever program he chooses, I think that team kind of becomes uh, the clear front runner in 2024. Now, last thing I got for you, Jesse, I couldn't let this slide. You, you threw in Hypel here into your – he's good, but it ain't enough yet. And, uh, of course, we've been following you since your days at VolQuest and all that. So uh, just, just quick thoughts on Hypel and, and why you say that. And not that I disagree with you or anything, but, uh, but my, my biggest issue with Hypel that I've seen recently is um, anytime someone leaves, it seems like he's promoting from within. And – you know, Kelsey Pope, I think you could argue that that was a solid one, but I don't know about the offensive coordinator. I don't know about the tight end coach. I'm not saying these are bad guys or, or anything like that. And and fans are questioning the offensive line coach. I, I think he's done a hell of a job, but recruiting has been kind of hit or miss. Does Hypel need to surround himself with more uh, elite recruiters, you think, to, to really take Tennessee over the over the uh, speed bump that, you know, and try to be more competitive with, with Georgia and, and Alabama and teams of this nature? Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't just, I think they missed Alex Golish last year. Um, I do. I, I think both on the recruiting trail and, and as kind of a, um, a collaborator offensively and a guy that a lot of players uh, seem to really respect um, and admire. I, you know, I kind of – I sat down with Alex uh, at the AFCA convention for a long time and um, – 
you know, he, he's a, he's a, he's a good character and a good personality. You can kind of see why folks kind of naturally um, flock to him. He kind of has uh, a little bit of like the, the PJ Fleck energy without the faux, uh, you know, s- stupid catchphrases and stuff. Um, and, and so I, I do think they missed him. And, you know, again, Josh Heupel has been way better as a recruiter at Tennessee than he was at UCF. He has absolutely kind of it's honestly exceeded my expectations because he did not recruit nearly as well as what Scott Frost had done, you know, as, as the predecessor there. And yet he has kind of been able to level up. Obviously, Tennessee's collective is one of the best collectives in the country. Um, but again, in this world, it's not to say that Tennessee hasn't done well on the recruiting trail. You you, you land a guy uh, like James Pierce, and he's you know he's a stud. You beat out Georgia and Alabama and stuff for one of the best pass rushers in the SEC. Um, but it's stacking more and more of those prospects on top of each other. Uh, I think they've all signed something like the the number twelve or eleventh class for on three in twenty twenty four. Solid, very good. But that's not good enough if you want to compete for championships on an annual level. It's good enough to get to the playoff, probably good enough to get to the playoff, maybe good enough to win a game. But I think what we're going to see, and we don't know it yet, but I think what we're going to see in this 12-team field to play this many games, you're talking about a team maybe having to play 17 games. That's where this roster depth and this stacking guys on top of one another becomes all the more important. And that's why, frankly, yes, technically there may be more – teams see more opportunity to quote unquote get to play for the championship. But really I think that that it's going to shrink who can actually win it because it's who can sustain playing that many games, whether it's injuries, attrition, you know, all the guys transferring, what have you. Um, and so Tennessee, I think does need to c- kind of continue to make strides and steps forward. If they want to be one of those teams, can they compete for the playoff next season? We'll see. You know, I think it's going to depend on, uh, Nico's development. How many pounds can he gain this off season? They clearly want to run him a lot. I think that's smart. I think that's a way for them to kind of uh, tap into an element of the offense they didn't have a year ago with Joe Milton. I I do like their skill talent. Um, you know, Hypo again. He's one of the best schemers. That's why I kind of compare. It's kind of why I mentioned him in the, in, in kind of a similar vein to DeBoer um, because he's another X's and O's savant. His offense clearly, you know, has a way to to do more. Uh, with less, there, there's a ceiling on that. There's a cap on on what that is. That doesn't. Yeah, you can do more with less and have a season like we did last year or two years ago with Hendon Hooker and Hyatt and whatnot. And and you, you beat Alabama and it, it's this awesome feeling. But then you kind of fizzle out um, because either you run out of gas or teams kind of figure stuff out. And so. It, 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 it's a talent acquisition game. That's what it always comes down to. That's what it is. That's what college football has absolutely become. Um, and so if Tennessee wants to continue to be in that conversation, I do think they kind of need to continue to push forward on the recruiting trail. Yeah. All right, Jesse, before you go, can you tell the audience, how can they f- follow you and how can they find your work? Yeah, man. Uh, I appreciate you having me on. You guys come follow me at on three, uh, You'll find my columns pretty regularly on, on the front page there. You can follow me on Twitter at, at jessere.simonton. So love love kind of arguing and interacting with SEC Mike, Cousin Shane, and those guys. So uh, it's always a good time. Good to catch up, man.